started to think about, I started to think about how my beginnings as a photo student were and remembering art history lessons that I had to take because it was photographic related. And I was really um, enthralled by that and really liked what I was hearing. I got into the history at that point. And that to me was, they talked about it in a way that made more sense to me than the way history is taught in uh, school where you learn about battle after battle and things that frankly I didn't care for because they seemed to be from a white man's perspective. And I wasn't, I didn't think that was really true. So I, little side there, I went looking what I could do with photography and I decided I didn't want to do some of the things that they did with having to go to New York to make it big. And I didn't want to be big, but I certainly didn't want to be the school photographer either. So I decided that I would take what I learned in my art history and my photo history classes from RIT, kind of mix it with the design history courses that I currently teach at MCC. And I wanted to bring you into a view from my perspective, including all the visual arts. Because to me, this whole artistic world is dependent on just being able to create and have the freedom to be able to create, create things, whether it is in photography, fine art, illustration, or even the newest design fields of UX UI, which is computer-based and network-based. So some would say there is beauty in algorithms and coding. So let me take you on a visual journey through my selection of these women that were important to me as I was learning about this part of the business. Mind you, this is only a part of a very larger uh, collection of women that created photography and other scientific advancements in the world of art. So, oh, wow, that didn't move. Okay, there's my little thing. Okay, so I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna take you through sort of the 19th century up to the early 21st century. I want to move us along sort of the current timeline. And I selected women, not only for their renown, but also the vision that they are now being viewed uh, as having really advanced things and their passions. I will impart the facts and observations that I've made along my own experiences and be able to talk to you a bit about how I think that this world of creative women should be viewed. So we're gonna start here. And this is the beginning that the cyanotypes of those blue uh, images in the center. Um, that you see there, as was the very first slide, the title slide there, uh, Anna Atkins' work was in the background there. Women have always been marginalized by men and in many places here in society. Throughout history, females, female photographers, they've generated some of the world's most iconic images. And this invaluable collection of images enhances the photographic record of places, people, and events. Despite the histories or the industry's penchant for favoring men, especially when it came to assignments like photojournalism, exhibitions, and promotions in a world of um, advancement for photographers, uh, I want us to look at a very compressed timeline of the women's involvement in photography because they were part of this genre. All right, so we're gonna start with these early pioneers. It was interesting to me as I started to do the research for this um, period from Anna Atkins on. And I, I came to this understanding that yes, the women that got ahead in this time frame were privileged. We were women, they were women of white uh, backgrounds. They were women of means. They had husbands that had means and these means might have been very well uh, shared with their uh, spouses. And so society was seeing the effects of the Industrial Revolution. All is governed through the focus on money. We want to make things work faster so we can do more of them in a shorter amount of time and have a larger output at the end, selling it along the way to earn money. So what I started to see was that this bottom line always included money. 
And it also brought about a decline because people were moving to the big cities. They were having a decline in, in subsistence living. People were not living off the land as much. They were moving to bigger populations, cities, to be able to get their share of these revenues that were all of a sudden out there in history. We see in Europe, there's a rise of specific societies. Many of them uh, come off of guilds that were established in the Renaissance. Science is also another form of thinking that is rel relatively new because we start to see people being able to talk about sciences and there are publications that you can start to see uh, people are doing experimentation. There are these scientifically minded gentlemen from these societies like the Royal Academies. You know, all these things were set up to benefit men that were involved in science and innovation. If they were enlightened men and happened to value the, the things their wives could bring to their own uh, endeavors and also support some of their own historical uh, interests and their scientific things that they were interested in. And many of these women were doing some really interesting things. You can just see on the slide here sort of what these innovations that start in the early 1800s, you know, they're not all done by women, but that's what we are looking at along the way in terms of what we have at the same time that photography is coming into its due. One such woman from this time period is the wife of Henry Fox Talbot, Constance Fox Talbot. She had both the su su financial support of her husband she had a kindred soul in the world of science, and her husband invented the calotype in the 1830s and patented it in 1841. She is the woman given the, uh, usually the nod to say the first woman that did anything in photography, but she didn't get it published and she was pretty much within her husband's sphere and worked with him more than anything else. This this calotype you know, was a, an innovation because the previous process was the daguerreotype. And if you know anything about daguerreotypes, they're glass to begin with. So if you drop them and break them, they are gone. They are also one-offs because you cannot print from them. They are not negatives, they are positives. So they often bound them in little leather cases that probably had some uh, maybe velvet or something underneath that was very soft so they could put their pictures there and see them. And often they had a cover that was something that uh, was also padded so they could protect this glass uh, portrait of someone that probably was dead. So the calotype was revolutionary because daguerreotypes, you could only get a single positive image. The revolutionary aspect of the calotype was it made of negative, it made something that you could use to print with ink, and now you can make multiple images, sort of like the, the snapshot of the day. All right, so that leads us to, sorry, here, let me let this person in, uh, Anna Atkins. She is the one that gets most of the notoriety about calotypes because she was starting to use it, not unlike one of her family friends, was using it to record their scientific notes, she did the same thing. She's given the credit as being one of the early women photographers, and she certainly was one of the earliest. Her use of photography for scientific purposes is what sets her apart. She was a British botanist whose use of cyanotypes, or she liked to call them sun prints, and if you have children or ever took them to museums, uh, our kids saw these all the time when we went to museums, they were sun prints. You could go and often kids would go and see the exhibits, but they would want something fun as a sort of memento. And so I remember sun prints being available and being able to go out into a summer day with something like leaves and be able to put them on the paper. And because the sun did the exposure very much like the calotype of its day, um, you had what was called a sun print or a cyanotype. Um, she used plants and algae. And you see some examples of the plants that she did photograph because the very first slide on the left is the title page of the first book 
that was published using photography. Um, this process of cyanotype, it involves an exposure of a mix of ammonia, iron citrate and potassium ferricide to an ultraviolet light that leaves a paper called Prussian blue color. And Anna Atkins, she was born in Kent, England. Her name was Anna Ch Children, and she was born in 1799. So this is where, you know, she had her start. Her mother died very young in Anna's life, and she was an infant. She, I think she died of complications from childbirth. But this led Anna to be very close with her father. And her father's name was John George Children. And he was a highly respected scientist, as well as a fellow and a secretary of the Royal Society of Science. And so again, like I said before, if there was a man of means that was involved with one of those specialized academies, uh, and had a wife or a child that was interested in similar things, those women were able to get ahead and be part of a tangential branch of the society. They were never able to join, but they were there. So Anna used this new technology in order to catalog the plant specimens she was gathering and that she was trying to catalog for herself. Cyanotype gave her a true marriage of science and art because in 1843, she published the book, Photographs of British Algae that you see there on the left. She wove together histories of women, science and art in there. And The Bluest of Blues is a current book looking at her as an English botanist and scientist and photographer, and one of the early women that got published. So like I said, she was trained as a botanist, she was an English scientist, she was an astronomer, and she was friends with, or her father was friends with, making her also friends, with Sir John Herschel, the leading astronomer uh, in England at that time. And he is the one that discovered the initial cyanotype process in 1842. So he used it to copy his notes and keep records. He wanted to make sure that he could preserve them in a way without having to rewrite them multiple times to be able to then print from. Okay, so let's see who else we've got. So we're gonna jump ahead to Julia Margaret Cameron. Now, when I was a photo student, I really liked her. And it was interesting because I only recently learned that uh, Julia Margaret Cameron, this is a painting by a Frenchman that was her. This is her as an older woman. This is her husband down here. And there's Sir John Herschel, her friend. So let me tell you a bit about her. She was one of my favorites. And I always thought of her in, I'm sure it was a very young student's idealized view of, oh, look, this woman's doing these beautiful images of stories. And she's illustrating with photography. And that was right up my alley because that was what I had been studying. And so I really enjoyed her work. And what I recently learned is she being born Julia Margaret Paddle, and she was born in Calcutta in 1815. She was the fourth of 10 children. And uh, her father was an official in the East India Company. And had sort of a riotous life and he earned a name, a nickname called Jim Blazes. And he was considered to be one of the biggest liars in India. So he sounds like a real character to me. And he had, he had four daughters and Julia Margaret was one of the youngest. And I, the legend goes that they were all very beautiful. Her sisters were all very beautiful. She was okay is essentially what the translation came back is nobody talked about her beauty, but she was very artistic and she was very creative. So they talked about the talent. Oh, like I said, she was, uh, as a child, she was one of four sisters. They were shuttled around quite a bit. She had a grandmother that lived in Versailles and there she spent most of her youth going to school in the Versailles region. She doesn't move until she's 18, she goes to live permanently in India. And in 1848, she and her then husband of 10 years 
Charles, excuse me, Hay Cameron there, they settle in England. And it's there in England that the Paddle Sisters enchanted London society with their beauty, their eccentricities, and they attracted many of the most artistic and original literary and scientific minds of the day. So they, she was a friend of, you know, Sir John Herschel, also Lord, Lord Tennyson, Darwin, and others of the time frame that were very popular in either of those creative arts. When they moved to England and they had their time in London, soon after that, they end up moving out to an area called Freshwater. It's on the Isle of Wight. And there uh, she receives, when she's about 46 or 48 years of age, a Christmas gift from her daughter and her son-in-law. And it was a camera. This is her first camera. And the gift came with an admonishment from the, the children saying that, mother, you ought to try photography during your solitude at Freshwater. In other words, it'll give you something to do while you're gonna be bored is what they thought. But she did jump at the chance to be able to work with this. She turns her greenhouse into a photo studio and dark room in areas. So she blocked up all the windows in some areas so she could do the uh, development of the images. And she had a 10 year, fairly prolific period of creating stories from the Bible, stories from mythology and tales of King Arthur and that sort of era of hero. Um, you see there's some samples of the work. You see one of the kings, and I think this might be depicting Ophelia and might be from Hamlet. So, and I know this one was a um, French novel that was very popular in the probably decade before she was born. And it was about a um, childhood friends that meet again as adults and one is swept overboard on the ship. And because the other one is so despondent, throws themselves into the ocean too. So, you know, it's got this whole melodramatic kind of thing. And that's what she was very good at. She could set a stage. She could bring costumes. She was known for going outside her house and grabbing anyone walking on the road around her or neighbors that she saw. She, she pulled um, <laughs> her friends in to do whatever she needed and wanted. And so they all helped along the way. She, uh, like I said, Herschel and Darwin, we also have uh, the, the writer of um, Alice in Wonderland. And we have Alice Liddell being brought into some of her uh, photographs as well. All right, let's bring on to the next era. We're going to move into the early 20th century, and this is where we start to see women very much being part of the genre and part of the uh, time frame that can work. All right, so we see more women are working outside the beginning of the 20th century. Women were outsiders to the formal structures of political life. You know, they were not really able to vote yet. Uh, they were serving, they couldn't hold offices. They, could ser they couldn't serve on juries. Um, they were subject to wide sort of ranging discrimination that marked them as secondary citizens. Just because you were born female, you already had a disadvantage. Women do gain the right to vote in 1920 with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. However, it's not fair for all women. If you are a divorced woman, you are shunned by society and you are treated as an outcast. So the women's suffrage movement did open up opportunities for female reporters to cut their teeth on national politics under the guise of women's news. However, female reporters often work without permanent office space, not too unlike female athletes today that are put into less than ideal locker rooms because the men have the men's teams have the good locker rooms. You're lucky to get a sink or a shower. Um, but you can start to see how women are starting to work and they're not always guaranteed an office space, not always guaranteed a salary. They may be paid something, but not necessarily guaranteed. And their access to those social clubs and the back rooms where men did conduct business was prohibited for them. So in response, the women began their own professional associations and when the depre depression threatened the tenuous foothold of women that were already employed in 
newspaper staffs, Eleanor Roosevelt comes right in and institutes a weekly women's only press conference. So she would have these, her husband's having these fireside chats and she's having these other things with women only to talk about um, what the status was and how to help each other. They, she also made it an, uh, something that was putting pressure on the other organizations that always employed men to have to have at least one woman employee in their reporting staff. And so during first, uh, Second World War, many of the newswomen in the ladies, uh, first ladies circle served as war correspondents. So we can start to see women coming into their own. We're gonna look at this first woman, Margaret Burke White. And I remember as a child, probably my junior year in high school, I, that Christmas, I received a, book on Margaret Burke White. And that was my first introduction to what women photographers could do. And so she was born Margaret White. She was born in Bronx, New York. She was the daughter of Joseph White, who was a non-practicing Jew. And her father came from Poland. And her mother, Minnie Burke, was of Irish Catholic descent. So she grew up near Bound Brook, New Jersey, and from her naturalist father, she learned about the environment around her. He also was an engineer and an inventor. And so she claimed to have learned perfectionism from him and her resourceful homemaker mother helped her develop an unapologetic desire for self-improvement. So Margaret's interest in photography really began as a hobby in her youth. This support was supported by her father's enthusiasm and his love of cameras. She did begin studying at Columbia University, but left after one semester. Her father had died. She felt she needed to go home and support the family. And so she transferred over time through multiple colleges to earn her degree. She ultimately graduated from Cornell University with a Bachelor of Arts in 1927. She left behind um, you know, her family from before. She now was living in Ithaca and she did then decide that she was going to leave Ithaca. She left a photographic study of the rural campus at its time. That was part of the school newspaper that she left behind. A year after she works on this school newspaper in her final year there, um, she moves to, from Ithaca to Cleveland, Ohio and she starts a commercial photography studio. She begins concentrating on architectural and industrial photography. And that was very unusual as a woman. One of Burke White's clients was Otis Steel Company. And her success was due to her skills with both people as well as her technique. The Otis security people didn't think she could handle it, didn't really think that she should be there, didn't want her there. So it made it very hostile for her. And they were reluctant to let her shoot for other reasons. First, they thought steel making was a defense industry. So they wanted to be sure national security was not endangered by letting a woman in. Uh, secondly, she was a woman. And in those days, you know, people wondered if women and her delicate camera could stand up to the intense heat Oh, and hazard and generally dirty and gritty environment of the mill. When she finally got permission, the technical problem started. So she was having issues with lighting, trying to photograph steel with sparks and red and orange colors shooting out in places. And there were problems with the exposure on the film, not getting enough exposure to be able to be uh, seen what was being talked or, uh, shot. So she starts uh, to experiment and relates uh, some of the technical problems she has to a friend. And they solve the problem by producing a white light by using magnesium flare. So she produces white light, sets up these assistants holding these flares to light her scenes so she can take a beautiful photograph inside an industrial plant. And this is what earns her national exposure and attention. She eventually moves out of the industrial photography into photojournalism. And in 1929, she accepted a job as the associate editor and staff photographer for Fortune magazine. That was a position she held until 1935. And in 1930, she became the first 
Western photographer allowed to enter the Soviet Union. During those mid thirties, Burke White, like Dorothea Lange, who we'll see in a few moments, um, decided they wanted to photograph the drought victims of the Dust Bowl. And so in 1937, she working for Life Magazine, her famous photograph of the black flooded victim standing in front of the bread line and de that dis declared that there was the world's highest standard of living there. So there's this poster for this white neighborhood when you had a whole bunch of people that were filthy, dirty, starving, and really were down on their luck. So it said that that photograph would later become the basis uh, for the artwork on Curtis Mayfield's 1975 album, There's No Place Like America Today. Burke White travels to Europe to record things in Germany and Czechoslovakia during World War II. She and her husband, Erskine Caldwell, um, publish books. They, they become a pair that works uh, as war correspondents. She is the first woman female uh, war correspondence. And she was the first, like I said, that was allowed to work in a combat zone as well as getting into the Soviet Union. In 1941, she traveled to the Soviet Union and that was just as Germany broke its pact of non-aggression. So she was the only photographer, foreign photographer in Moscow when the German forces invaded. She took refuge in the US embassy and then captured the ensuing firestorm on campus, or excuse me, on camera. So she sees a lot of war through the Second World War. She rides in a, a bomber, with a bomber on a mission. Uh, she's photographing from there. She is, she's exposed to everything. She's seeing everything that's happening in the World War II. And she's been talked about perhaps that she used the camera to almost shield her and give her relief. It interposed a slight barrier between herself and the horror that was in front of her. So it is something that did affect her and you see it being reflected and affecting her future work. She goes on from World War II and she's the main photographer in India and Pakistan when that is starting to break in terms of the separation of the two countries. She serves in the, uh, during the Korean War. So she's in the midst of a lot of really tough stuff that's happening. They say that she had a knack for being in the right place uh, just on a good, uh, good knack of doing that. She was able to photograph Mahatma Gandhi a few hours before his assassination in 1948. Her friend and colleague, Alfred Eisenstadt, also a photographer, said one of her strengths was that there was no assignment and no picture that was unimportant to her. She also started the first photography laboratory at Life Magazine. In 1953, Burke White develops her first symptoms of Parkinson's disease. She's forced to slow down her career to fight the encroaching paralysis in 1959 and 1961. She undergoes several operations, experimental treatments to help the condition. It effectively ended the tremors she was suffering, but it also affected her speech. The pension plan she set up for herself in the 1950s, even though it was very generous at that time, it no longer covered her healthcare costs. And she also suffered financially from personal generosity and giving things away to those less responsible and could not afford some of the care that she needed. Oh, let's move on to Dorothea Lang, because she's another one with grit. And that is her picture there, one of her last pictures that she took or had taken of, of her with her camera. Um, Dorothea Lang was born Dorothea Margareta Nutzhorn, and she was an American documentary photographer, as well as a photojournalist. She is best known for her depression era work, like you see the migrant mother up above. And uh, she did this through the Farm Security Act where she was able to travel around and photograph the victims of the Dust Bowl. She was born in Hoboken, New Jersey to a second generation German immigrants. And she was one of two children. She had a younger brother named Martin. 
two early events really shaped Lang's uh, path as a photographer. First, at age seven, she contracts polio. It left her weakened with a weakened right leg and a permanent limp. She is known to say it formed me, guided me, instructed me, helped me, and humiliated me. Second uh, incident was five years after she contracted polio, her father abandons the family. He, it, this prompts her mother to gather the kids and move in from the suburban New Jersey, where they can't really afford that, to a poorer neighborhood in New York City. Later, Burke White drops her father's name and takes on her mother's name, her maiden name. So by growing up in Manhattan's Lower East Side, she was left alone a lot of the time. Why her mother had to work to support them. Lang was able to wander the streets in New York, fascinated by a variety of the people that she saw. And she learned to observe without intruding. And that was a skill that she would later use as a documentary photographer. She began her study of photography at Columbia University and gained informal apprenticeships with several New York photography studios. Ultimately, she settles in San Francisco. She finds work as a finisher in a photographic supply shop. And in 1920, she marries a noted Western painter, Maynard Nick Dixon, and with whom she has two sons. Uh, her early studio work mostly involved shooting portrait photography. And it was of the social elite in San Francisco. When the onset of the Great Depression occurred, she turned her lens from that studio to the street. And her photographs during this period bear kinship to John Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath. So while she's in the midst of this depression, she starts to photograph the people. She leaves her studio to document the lives. She roams the byways with her camera and portrays the extent of the social and economical upheaval of the depression. It's here that she finds her real purpose, her direction as a photographer. She no longer wanted to be a portraitist, but neither was she a photojournalist. Instead, she became known as one of the first of a new kind of photographer, a documentary photographer. And she worked with the Farm Security Act. She also worked with the Japanese internment camps in America. She saw a lot of social causes and she photographed everything she could. And it's her studies of the unemployed and the homeless that captured the attention of local photographers and media. She divorces in 35 and then quickly marries an economist named Paul Schuster Taylor, who is a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. For the next five years, they travel the California coast together, as well as the Midwest documenting, documenting excuse me, the rural poverty in general and the exploitation of sharecroppers and migrant laborers. Uh, Taylor interviewed subjects and gathered economic data while Lang produced photographs and accompanying data. They lived and worked from Berkeley the rest of their lives. In 1945, Ansel Adams invited Lang to teach at the first fine art photography department at the California School of Fine Arts. It's now known as the San Francisco Art Institute and Imogene Cunningham and Minor White also joined the faculty. In 1952, Lang co-founds the photography magazine called Aperture. And she does this with Ansel Adams, Melton Ferris. We have Ernie, uh, Ernest Louis, Barbara Morgan, Beaumont Newhall that came out of the Rochester area, had stuff out here, Nancy Newhall, his wife, Dodie Warren and Minor White. So you've got some of the big luminaries of the photography era of that time coming together with this magazine. Today, Aperture still exists. It's published four times a year, published in the spring, summer, fall, and winter. It features photographs by established as well as emerging photographers. And each artist is experimenting with photo-related media. And each issue is usually themed and includes writings by critics scholars, photography, practitioners, and others who are involved in the field of photography. Lang's health declines, and in the last decade of her life, among the ailments she suffered from 
was what later was identified as a post polio syndrome. She dies, she died of esophageal cancer in 1965 in San Francisco at the age of 70. Okay, so we're gonna move forward into the mid to late 20th century because while we have the photojournalists that have just started and the documentarians, we're now gonna to start to see that continue and we're going to start to add activism into this whole mix too. So what we start with is this woman, Diane Arbus. And I remember her from my studies and I always was fascinated because her images were not beautiful. They were, they, sometimes they were cute, but they were often areas that were very difficult for me, growing up in the Midwest, they were things I had never seen. She is an American photographer. Her imagery helped to normalize marginalized groups and highlight the importance of proper representation of all people. Just don't, you just don't show one type of person. Arbus was born Diane Nemiroff in 1923. Her mother Gertrude chose her daughter's name, but she pronounced it D Anne, and talent was really abundant in the Numeroff family. It was a wealthy New York clan that ran Rosix, a fashionable Fifth Avenue department store. Her older brother becomes a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Howard Numeroff. He was named the U.S. Poet Laureate in 1988. Her younger sister, Renee Sparkia, becomes a sculptor and designer. And after she retires from Rusix, their or he retires from Rusix, their father, David Nemiroff, launched a second successful career as a painter. So her artistic and literary gifts were apparent very early on. Her father encouraged her to become a painter and she studied art in high school. At the age of 14, she falls in love with Alan Arbus. He was a 19 year old nephew of one of her father's business partners. So the parents didn't approve, but she had this infatuation. The romance flourished in secret. Soon Diane loses interest though in painting and going to college saying her only ambition was to become Alan's wife. She said, I hated painting and I quit right after high school because I was continually told how terrific I was. I had the sense that if I was so terrific at it, it wasn't worth doing. So Diane and Alan do get married as soon as she turns 18 in 1941. Her parents are not pleased, but they do accept him into uh, they do accept him into their family. The couple, the Arbuses, pursued a shared interest in photography. They turned their bathroom of their apartment their Manhattan apartment into a part-time dark room. David Nemiroff, her brother, gave them work shooting fashion photographs for Rusik's advertisement. And then during World War II, Alan serves in the military uh, as a military photographer. She does not go. But after the war, the Arbus's career as commercial photographers takes off. And soon they're working together for top women's magazines and advertising agencies. Usually Alan is the one shooting pictures while Diane comes up with the clever ideas and props for the use. Diane also took care of her two children uh, during this period of time. Soon after the kids are, are uh, established, this is like in the later 50s, both of them become very frustrated by the limitations that the stresses that are there in the fashion world. They don't like what the pressure they feel from the, the people they're shooting for. Diane wanted to be an artist, not just a stylist, which is what she did. And Alan dreamed of becoming a, an actor. So their growing discomfort put strain on their marriage, as did the depressive episodes Diane suffered. Uh, she had similar despairing remark or similar despairing periods like those that paralyzed her own mother. And in 1956, Diane quits the couple's, couple's business in order to make photographs on her own. Alan continued to work under the name Diane and Alan Arbus while taking acting classes and beginning a career in the theater. All right, that's pretty much all I'm gonna talk about her, the 
you know, they go on and do their thing. But I do want to talk about this lady, this lady, Annie, Annie Leibowitz. She is quite a woman and she is one that I would imagine, even though I haven't shown you her most famous works, we'll talk about them here in a minute. And I know you know some of these, but like it says here, she is considered one of the major chroniclers of this 20th century. She has a very large and distinguished body of work, and it encompasses most of the well-known portraits of our time. She's photographed a wide array of subjects, ranging from presidents all the way to rock stars and queens and athletes and just normal people. Leibowitz is widely regarded as the major chronicle of the 20th century. She was born Anna Lou Leibowitz, and she was born in Waterbury, Connecticut. This was 1949. She is the third of six children born to Marilyn and Sam Leibowitz. Her mother studied modern dance with Martha Graham and was a, excuse me, a dance instructor while her father worked in a rubber mill until he later joined the Air Force during World War II. Due to her father's, her father's military career, the family moved often. It was during that time that Leibowitz began to view the world through a lens. She realized when they're driving in the car, she looks out the window, that's a lens. That's a, a picture frame right there. And so this was the window of the car where she started to notice and then she starts to understand it as a frame. And later through the photographic lens, she begins to document their travels. In 1967, Leibovitz enrolls in the San Francisco Art Institute with the intent of studying painting. During her second year though, she signs up for a night class in photography and shortly thereafter changes her whole major. She finds photography better suits her personality because of its speed and realism. In 1970, while still a student, she submitted photographs to Rolling Stone and they were of the anti-war rallies in San Francisco around uh, Berkeley. One of the photographs was selected for the cover of the magazine and it was a special issue on campus riots as well as protests. She was offered a job as a staff photographer, which she did. She graduates with a Bachelor of Arts in 71 and by 73, she was a Rolling Stone chief photographer. During this time, she creates a striking number of iconic photographs. And I'll explain these because I know you'll know who these are. She was and is considered the foremost rock music photographer. And she has an astute documentarian of the social landscape. Some of her most famous Rolling Stone photographs include President Richard Nixon's resignation, Mick Jagger's international tour, and that photograph of a naked John Lennon curled up around his fully clothed wife, Yoko Ono. And that was taken five hours before he was killed. That was in 1980. Within 10 years of that, her photographs are gracing the cover of 142 issues of Rolling Stone. She wanted to seek diversity of her subject matter. She leaves Rolling Stone in 83 and joins the staff of Vanity Fair. She is a well-known portraits from her time at Vanity Fair include the Demi, Demi Moore nude and pregnant image, as well as Whoopi Goldberg half submerged in a bathtub of milk. Also in 83, she published her first book, Annie Leibovitz Photographs, and this compiled many of the celebrity portraits that she had taken over the first por portion of her career. She's published books, showed her work in numerous museums or in the US as well as internationally, she works with actors, directors, writers, musicians, athletes, political and business figures, as well as her fashion photographs. She's expanded her collective portrait of contemporary life. In 1999, she published a book called Women, and it was a collaboration with her longtime partner, Susan Sontag. Women features the portraits of over 200 women, all from all walks of life, some from celebrities to Supreme Court justices to lost Vegas showgirls, as well as coal miners. Leibowitz explains the book explores questions like, who are we? What do we look like? And what do we look like today? You know, 
It's an endless project, she says she started. She doesn't know how to stop. She doesn't want to stop with that book. She said it just continues. And I would assume that she's going to continue as long as she can. She's the recipient of many honors. She has uh, made a name for herself. She's got work that's uh, been considered a living legend and is in the Library of Congress. She lives in New York with her children and continues to chronicle the American culture already adding to her immense and impressive work. Okay. Next, we're gonna look at Nan Golden. And Nan Golden also is a chronicle of time. And the photograph in the left is pretty brutal. It's a, it was taken, she took it of herself a month after she was battered. She had a really tough life, um, a lot of it of her own making, and she acknowledges that. She was born in 1953 in Washington, D.C. to a middle-class Jewish family. Her father was in broadcasting, so the family moves to the Boston area. She suffers two uh, trial, excuse me, three uh, childhood traumas. The family has lots and lots of tension. I don't think the parents get along. I think they're moving around a lot. I don't know how faithful her father is, but there's tension all the time in the family. There's an issue with sexuality, both for herself and I believe within the family. So they're just, it was not a heavy, uh, it was not a light place to live. And the third thing included the suicide by her sister. She killed herself and Golden was 11 years old at that time. As she becomes a young teen, she starts to compensate for the grief with marijuana. She starts to date older men. She leaves home. But somehow, when she's 16, someone gives her a camera. And she's still struggling with her sister's death. So she uses the camera and photography to cherish her relationships that she's engaged with. So she starts to photograph the people that are important to her around her. She also finds that the camera is a useful political tool. And she uses it to inform the public about important issues that are often silenced in American press. Her early influences include Andy Warhol's early films, Federico Fellini, The French and Italian Vogue, and Helmut Newton, the photographer. She graduates from the School of Museum of Fine Arts in, late, in the late 1970s and moves to New York City. She begins to document the sto Stonewall gay subculture and was especially drawn to the hard drug subculture of the Bowery. Photography from the late 70s and early 80s periods form her slideshow, The Ballad of Sexual, uh, excuse, Sexual Dependency. She called her work slideshows. She didn't just put together an exhibition. She called them slideshows and she took them and moved them around so that she could show different dangerous aspects of youthful abandonment to the scenes of parenthood family life and progressively worldwide settings. So she's really dealing with a lot of bad stuff. And in 1917, excuse me, excuse me, in 2017, she starts getting more involved in activism. While she's giving a speech in Brazil, she real, reveals that she is a recovering opioid addict, specifically to Oxycontin. And it, that was prescribed to her with a bad wrist injury and she just became dependent. She sought treatment for her addiction and she battled through rehab. This leads her to pursuing a social medium activism against the Sackler family, the people that make Oxycontin. She established a group called PAIN, Prescription Addiction Intervention Now. And she mounted worldwide protests against the family and staged sit-ins and protests at worldwide museums. She wanted people, uh, and she threatened to pull her work from museums that had her work because, unless they refused to accept the money that was offered by any Sackler, Sackler family uh, to donation. She wanted the museums, she wanted them to let the millions of pounds go away, dollars, everything. But she was adamant about it. She would not let them use her work. She would not do whatever. And her work is controversial. It's not accepted worldwide. But there are some countries with very heavy censorships 
that either the censorships or the politics of the country, they just refuse to show her work because of the intimate nature. So she really is looking at all these different subcultures and how they are portrayed and what actually happens. So her work is tough to review. It's tough to see. It's tough to think about. And, you know, I had a hard time looking at that image of her because that was something that she had to deal with too. All right, now we're gonna move up to the early 20th century. And what am I doing on time? Okay, oh, all right. We're gonna start with this woman, Petra Collins. Um, she's interesting. Uh, I don't know a lot about her, but because I teach at the college level, I have a lot of students that are listening to things that she actually is involved with today. Petra Collins was born in 1992. She's even younger than my daughter. Uh, she is a Canadian artist. She's a director of photography. She's a fashion model and she's an actress and she rose to prominence in the early 2010s. Her photography is characterized by a feminine dreamlike feel. They are informed as part of what everybody has given her as the female gaze approach. So I heard a professor of photography mention that it's the faraway stare. And so, yes, it's the same kind of thing, the female gaze, faraway stare. She's directed a number of short films, including, including excuse me, music videos for Carly Rae Jepsen, Little Yachty, Selena Gomez, Cardi B, as well as Olivia Rodrigo. That image right next to the, uh, the brutal image there, that is the video uh, for uh, Olivia Rodrigo's piece. And there is a website. You may go and look at that yourself. I am not gonna play it. I have no problem with it, but I think there might be people that are bothered by it because it does have, it's not NC-17. Um, this January in 20, uh, 2022, that, that video right there had amassed over 300 million views on YouTube. Collins was raised in Toronto, and at the age of 15, she begins practicing the art of photography. She attended the Ontario Co uh, College of Art and Design for two years, and then she studied artistic criticism and curatorial practice while there. She begins taking pictures in high school. She met Richard Kern, who is a, an artist, and she assisted him on a shoot, and he becomes her mentor. Simultaneously, Collins becomes a frequent subject of photographer Ryan McGinley. He goes on to become, or she goes on to become one of his protégés, and she begins venturing into the art world, appearing in shows that feature her own artwork. She um, curates shows that feature her art collective, and she's part of a collective group that she's named Arduous. She coincides, uh, all of this coincides with her rising success in the art world. Her Instagram account was removed because from the platform because she posted a photo of herself, her unwaxed in a bikini self. And so, Instagram had a problem. Because of this removal of her account, Collins wrote an essay for the Huffington Post, speaking out against the misogyny, which informs media depictions of women's bodies. In 2014, her first solo exhibition, Discharge, was a photo series spanning between 2008 and 2014. These are from her ages of 15 to 21. She's been hosted at a variety of museums and galleries in New York, and uh, her, her exhibition Discharge continues to push the narrative for a more authentic view of girlhood and womanhood. That controversial Instagram bikini shot began this, and Collins goes on to publish a photo book in 2010 based out of the same thing. She's been featured, curated over a dozen shows since 2011. She spans from galleries in New York to Miami's Art Basel to San Francisco. She is a frequent editorial photographer for publications like Vogue, 
Purple Magazine, ID Magazine, Wonderland, Dazed and Confused, Love Magazine. She's also a photographer and has campaigns that she's developed for Levi's, Adidas, Calvin Klein, as well as Stella McCarthy. She's become very heavily involved in the directing and ranging of documentaries to music videos. So there are a number of things I think this woman you will see in your future from her. She is very active. Now my last artist is Deanna Lawson. And I wanna talk about her because she, she, I didn't know who she was until I started this, but I did like her work. I like what she's done. And she actually, I wanted to include her because she was born right here in Rochester, New York. She received her MFA in photography from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2004. Her work examines the body's ability to channel personal and social histories, addressing themes of familial legacy, community, romance, spiritual, and spiritual aesthetics. Her practice borrows from simultaneous visual traditions ranging, ranging excuse me, hang on a second. Pardon me. Okay, her practice borrows from simultaneous visual traditions that range from photographic and figuratively portraiture, social documentary aesthetics, and a vernacular family album photographs. She is visually inspired by the, by the materiality of black culture and its expression as seen through the body and in domestic environments. Lace curtains, artificial nails, blemished skin, color weave, plastic couch covers are examples of visual material that Lawson identifies and heightens in her pictures. Careful attention is given to lighting and pose, both formal constructs used to transform, inform, and intensify representations of power and liberation to the personal and intimate space. Lawson meets her subjects in everyday walks of life, grocery stores, subway trains, busy avenues in Bed-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, and road trips taken into the Deep South. She received the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2013 and gave her the opportunity to photograph internationally. She did the uh, Democratic Repun Republic of the Congo, Haiti, Jamaica, and Ethiopia. Her first comprehensive museum survey exhibition was for Boston, uh, for Eva Raspini for ICA Boston and Peter Ellery for MoMA. And she premiered at the Boston in the fall of 21. She will travel to MoMA in New York and in Atlanta in the first part of uh, this last uh, month. Other notable exhibitions include things in Los Angeles, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, and she currently teaches at the University of Princeton. So this is what I have for you tonight. Are there any questions out there? I think what I'll do is let me stop the share. Oh, before I do that, just so you know it's legit, here are the citations, lest, you, lest I forget to share them. All right, are there any questions out there? Anybody have anything they want to say, ask questions about? Well, thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Judy. Thank you very much. That was a very, uh, a great um, presentation. Uh, I wondered if you are familiar with Deborah Willis and Carrie Mae Weems. These are yes. outstanding African-American women photographers. Yes. And if so, I wondered if you considered these women pioneering and why they wouldn't have been, uh, you know, why they weren't included in, in this group since they've been around for quite some time and are quite renowned. Thank Every, you. Absolutely, I agree with you, Judy. That was what I started out with in terms of this. I had, I had too many people. 
I didn't have, you know, I mean, I didn't have enough time. And so I started out looking at the women that I was really drawn to as a photo student. And then I sort of challenged myself to be able to look around and see who else was out there, who else I knew from my studies, but who I didn't know. And so I just, I found lots of women that are, have absolutely every aspect of uh, legitimacy and should have been included. But unfortunately I had a limited time and I wanted to do it justice. And yes, Carrie Mae uh, Weems was one that um, uh, Lawson, uh, Deanna Lawson was influenced by. So that, you know, a lot of these things, and I've just given you a very truncated version, sort of the quick synopsis of their life and some of the things that were of interest to me. But in terms of these women, they were so deep. You know, there's a lot of information about Nan Golden that really kind of shocked me um, because, you know, I've known of, I know of, of photographers that hung around and they hate Asbury. I mean, my God, look at the musicians that we've seen die because of drugs and stuff. Well, there were photographers right along with them. Uh, some of them were activists in a multiple different places. And you can see this all throughout history with women. I just had to make a decision to only include, I think it was 20 slides is what I had, something like that. So Judy, that could be another talk for another time. I would absolutely agree with you on that. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Enjoyed the program. Thank you. Anybody else? I see some of my colleagues are also here. Thank you for coming guys. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciated everything that you uh, paid attention to, and I hope that you had some fun. Thank you, March. That was really interesting. I love these photographers, especially I'm a big fan of Anna Atkins and Julia Margaret Cameron, and of course, 20th century photographers. I just like them all. Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty gutsy women out there. There um, are. That were mm -hmm. out there really in the trenches. And, you know, what we don't know is just the horrors they saw, as well as the conditions they had to go through and what they did. And, and you know, I, I would venture to say that most women that attended this tonight have had some experience in life that was not so positive and they were judged because they were women, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, it's, it's a tough one. And that's certainly in my, um, it gets stuck in my craw if you can't tell. I am always trying to make sure that we have women represented along the way. And certainly more and more women of the world. Just wait till the next talk on the illustrators and we'll see what we can get in terms of everything else. So thank yeah. you for recording this, Nancy. I appreciate it. Sure, I'll send the link out to everybody when it's ready. It takes a while and yeah. I'm not working until Saturday and I'm kind of sick. So you probably won't get it till Saturday. That's perfectly fine. That's okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you, March. It was great. Like all Thanks. your um, discussions. Okay, bye-bye, right, everyone. Folks. Thanks for coming. Yep, have, have a good one, all. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Yep.